11 years old, I used to build entire worlds with my toys. You see, my playing room was only cleaned on Thursday, so that gave me six days to build whatever I wanted. So I built zoos and parks and towns and villages and entire cities, a spy cave for my brother, anything that I could imagine. And then when I was done building and done setting everything up, I would take the tiny figurines that I had and I would put them in the locations that I had created. And I would make them interact with their surroundings. And this phenomena has always interested me. Since I was very little, I had questions like, why do we have a mayor? Or why do some place places feel nicer than others? Or why do we allocate specific things to specific zones? So roughly 10 years later, when I had to choose an education, I went to study urban and regional planning. And my studies gave me answers to a lot of the questions that I had, except for one. How do we manage environmental planning on a global scale? So in search of an answer to this question, last year I went to, to the United States to study abroad and follow a course there called International Development and Change. And this course taught me a lot about how the world works, or rather, how it sometimes doesn't. The course didn't give me the answer that I was looking for and instead gave me more questions. I started to wonder, why is it that we grow corn in Africa for the pigs in Europe while the people in Africa are starving? Why is it that it takes at least six different countries to just assemble one pair of shoes? Why does it matter which country you are in or where the border is? when we are trying to solve global, pro global problems like climate change. Isn't the planet from all of us? And doesn't that make us all equally responsible for fixing the situation that we're in? With these questions left unanswered, which was frustrating to say the least, I went to travel the world. I went to Asia and to Australia because I wanted to explore, like many people from my generation. So I visited every single temple that I could, and I appreciated every single site. And I really valued how unique every single place was that I went to. But the more places that I visited, the more I started to realize how strange it is that we do this all the time in the places that we don't know, but hardly ever in the places that we live in. As if we don't appreciate or value the areas that we call home, as if they're not as important, as if we have lost our connection to the places that should matter most in our lives. So when I came home after four months of traveling, I started to realize that maybe the answer to the questions that I had was in reconnecting to the places that we live in and solving problems locally for once, rather than trying to figure out how we should do this on a global scale. And since then, I've been doing everything in my power to find out how on earth we were going to achieve this. So I've done a lot of digging and I've talked to a lot of people. And today I would like to share with you three different things on how I think this is possible. The first one is to make sure that we use the Environment and Planning Act here in the Netherlands, also known as the Omgevingswet, that is coming in 2021. For those who don't know it, this law has the possibility, the ability to change everything that we know and currently do in urban and regional planning. You see, in the very core of this law, in the very first article, it states that we are all responsible for taking care of our environment and we are all responsible for preventing damage to this environment. This means that we as people or inhabitants of an area we can step up and say no and hold accountable the parties, whether they're government or market parties, that are harming our environment or taking away value. But we cannot do this as individuals. We have to do this as a collective. And the best way, if you ask me how we can do this, how we can achieve this, is to unite ourselves in cooperations. Because when we are all united in our own area cooperation, we share in the interest and the benefits and the profit of an area, but we also suffer its losses of value together. 
This means that we don't have to participate in someone else's game through info nights or official complaints at your municipality. No, we can step up. And as a collective, as a cooperation, we be can become an equal player next to governments and market parties when we are talking about area development. This means that we can focus on our own areas again and reconnect and start solving things on a local scale and have impact on a global level afterwards. The second thing that I think that we need to do is move towards a value-driven system. Our current system is run by politics and economics, and that makes power and money the most important values in our lives. And this means that we have moved towards a society in which we know what things cost, but don't really realize how much they're worth. Just think to yourself, how important is health or safety? or livability, or happiness, having a future, how important is it to you? I would say that these are the most important things in our lives, yet for some reason, we do not incorporate this in our system. I'll give you an example. Regenerative farming is a way of farming that doesn't use the standard fertilizers that are so harmful, and it doesn't use one single crop, but multiple. What they do is they take carbon dioxide from the air and they put it into the soil. So not only is this good for taking away greenhouse gases and making our planet warm up slow, less fast, it also helps in, inter in the interaction between crops and soil, which makes it more easy for water to infiltrate into the ground. And then especially in times with extreme drought, such, such as last summer here in the Netherlands, it's important that we have that storage of water in our soil, but also in times of extreme rain, which will become more frequent because of climate change. The water can flow away more easily and then not drown the crops that we grow. Sounds like a solution that we should all be doing, right? All farmers should be doing this. But here's the thing. The banks, they don't agree with me. You see, the banks only care about money because money is this, the value that runs our system. And the banks aren't sure if this way of farming makes enough revenue and enough profit, or at least not as much as the way that we do farming right now. So what they do is they put those farmers that want to try to innovate, they put them in what we call special asset management, bijzonder beheer. And then the farmers are held onto by a leash, they're put on under a magnifying glass, they're restricted in their further innovations because it's harder for them to spend their money, because their operations are closely monitored. In our system right now, we are punishing the farmers that could possibly save our planet. If we turn this around, if we recognize the value that those farmers add to our environment, and not just look at the money, and we combine those, we can start rewarding the farmers. We can say, hey, what you're doing is good for a planet, so we want you to try and figure out how to improve this method, and how to make it even better. In a value-driven system, this is possible, because in a value-driven system, we can reward those that are trying to innovate and add value in other ways than money. The third thing that I want to share with you today is, in my opinion, the most important if we want to make this change, and it is to organize maneuverability. We have become shy, not shy to form opinions or shy to speak our minds. We have become shy to act. We have become scared of doing something different from what everybody else is doing. We don't want to stick our necks out and try something new because it could mean that you could fail. A failure, that means that you could lose your face or worse, your money. So we don't do it. And it's a shame because this slows down progress. And it's a shame because it's so easy to undo. Because all we have to do is unscare ourselves of failure. I'll give you another example. Me. I'm standing here today telling you that these three points might possibly save the planet. I'm telling you this story that these things will change our lives. 
but I'm not 100% sure of the impact that it will have. And it might be that somewhere I'm wrong and it doesn't turn out to work the way that I think it works. But it doesn't matter because I don't see this as failing. Because if I'm wrong and if I make a mistake or if some aspect of it doesn't turn out to be true, I see this as a chance to maneuver myself into a new attempt. I'll try again. And I'll just keep on trying and I'll keep on going until I get it right. Because there's no point in waiting for someone else to learn how to do it for me. Because there's no time we need to change. So I'll just keep on trying and I act on what I think is the right thing to do. After all, we only learn to ride a bike after we've crawled on off a couple of times. And that's just learning to ride a bike. Imagine how many mistakes we have to make if we want to change the way the world works. So I want to invite you all to join me in making as many mistakes as we can and trying to figure out how we can solve the situation that we're in. Four months ago, I came home for my travels. And since then, I've done everything in my power to make people aware of the challenges that we face. And luckily, when I look around, I see that change is happening. I see that we're getting there. The movement that we're in is inevitable, but we can control how fast it goes. And I would like to invite you to join me in this, because I truly believe that it doesn't matter if you want to do something with food or health or waste, or any topic that you feel sympathetic about. As long as you use your power and your influence in your own local area, you can and you will make a difference. <laughs>